Welcome everyone to the maintainership working group. It is May 4th. Um, let me go over some follow up since last time. Uh, first of all, this is a new meeting set up to accommodate more team members, but now uh, after looking at the team members that were invited to this meeting compared to the one on Monday, I might reschedule the Monday. Scheduling is very difficult with the amount of people. Um, so that's evolving. Um, depending on when you check the exit criteria, there might have been 10 or 11 bullet points in the exit criteria, but Nick and Darva have consolidated a lot of that. Um, and so some of these epics are filled out already with issues that used to be previous exit criteria, but instead wrap up under these uh, um, now. All of these epics still need more issues in them though, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is exit criteria zero. This used to be the first exit criteria, which is representation. Um, I put here, I'd like to have the, fall, uh, the final volunteers by end of this week, but there is an updated comment on here from me where I made some suggestions in terms of who those seven functional leads should be. The list actually has eight on it. Um, so before I move on, I don't know if anyone had comments, suggestions, if you disagreed with the people that I recommended or anything like that. Okay, so I'm going to follow up on that issue async and see if we're good, if we need to make changes. Um, first thing that I'm always going to ask the exit criteria epics, uh, some of them still don't have DRIs. And so of, of you all that are on the call today, there are some epics that don't have DRIs. Would you like to volunteer to lead one of those initiatives? And Robert, I see that you've kind of already picked one. Um, why that one? Uh, I figured that one I might be vaguely qualified for <laughs> as okay. compared to the other ones. Um, but I'm not, uh, I don't mind if somebody else would prefer to have it uh, at all. But it's a, yeah, I feel like I could probably do that one. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, let me see. So that it gives us the exercise. So we would still be missing create an implementation plan to remedy gaps in maintainership coverage and develop and implement a communication plan for maintainership changes. That last one, I'm sure, is probably blocked by the other four. Um, so is there anyone on the call who wants to take the first one? OK, we can do that one offline as well. OK. Can I just, um... Sure. So I just wanted to understand what was involved in this one. So when we say identify gaps in maintainership coverage, um, by maintainership coverage, we mean on all projects and all areas are in scope for this working group? Could be. Most so like, for instance, GitLab Shell, I know, has some issues with coverage at the moment. Yeah, it could be. Probably not. Um, we do have an is part of product selector. And so the, the first thing on this epic would be, for example, the maintainer K KPI, the maintainer ratio. That's only using back end, front end database for the GitLab project. Um, should that include more? It's kind of an open ended question. We have 288 projects that fall under that product category. Should they all be included in this working group? Which ones should, which ones shouldn't? So there are a lot of questions to ask for that one. Um, but you brought up GitLab Shell. Is there a process that we'll discuss in this working group that should apply to GitLab Shell? Should it be treated the same? Should it be treated differently? And so, like I said, with all of these epics, they are missing those issues. There are a lot of questions. Does that make sense? OK, so for GitLab Shell, we could um, use the what we've learned from this working group to apply it to GitLab Shell, but this working group doesn't need to deal with GitLab Shell. Is that, is that right? I'm going to make this answer clear as mud. Um, that could be right. It might not be right. I think probably what we'll find okay. when, we, when we dig into the data is that GitLab Shell probably should be included. Um, 
one of the reasons for this working group is there are a lot of complaints that maintainers are overwhelmed and that there aren't enough maintainers. I know that that's a complaint of GitLab Shell as well. And so I would assume that GitLab Shell qualifies for that, but that we're missing data on things like that. Did I help or hurt the answer? Uh, no, I think that helps. So um, I think it sounds like we're sort of talking about a core set of projects here, not the full, like I said, like Max said, I didn't know there was 288, but like the sort of the main pain points, I guess. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. That was a really good question. Um, okay, go ahead, Robert. Uh, I added a few discussions, but uh, oh, we can start with the second one potentially because the that's relevant to workhorse shell and stuff like that. Um, if they are uh, going to be involved in this, they are probably quite awkward. Um, database is a little bit different, um, but my, I mean, workhorse and shell is technically in my team, but like we're supposedly mostly responsible for it. Um, but we're all still learning Go, which makes it very hard to be a maintainer for a project which is so performance specific in particular, um, where maintainers for that project probably don't need to know the project as much as they need to really know Go well. And that's quite different, I think, to the main GitLab application because most of us, um, if you're a backend, maintainer or reviewer are already very familiar in Ruby because that's the main thing we're working in every day. Whereas um, those projects are a little bit different. I had a similar sort of issue with database because I was a database reviewer and I uh, resigned from it because I just don't make database changes. So my experience in the database uh, is not really relevant and so it feels quite difficult to review for it and particularly to be a maintainer if you're not doing it every day or often enough um so i resigned from that because i was just like I, I don't know what queries are going to be optimum uh because i'd written about five in my time at the company because <laughs> we just don't do that many of them and uh i think the same is true of uh, of workhorse and show and I think you really need to be working on that project a lot or already an expert in the language so I think there, there's some sort of different questions around that compared to the GitLab repo yeah how many people how much time do we spend working on GitLab shell like I personally how many people work have, on it? I've set it up so that's about as much as I've done and that's technically in my team uh it was predominantly uh, Nick Thomas and uh, yeah, I think there's probably less than five <laughs> um, from what right. I can remember. Because for workhorse, I know that like, um, you know, one of the maintainers is Jakob uh, Fossmeyer, who's on my team. So he's not necessarily doing workhorse work day to day, but he wrote the initial version. So like he's got the, the context, but like you said, I think I think you do need one of the two. You either need to be working in it day to day or have a strong historical uh, context for the project. And if you don't, it's not really practical to ask for maintainers from people who aren't working on something already. Yeah. Right. Like the the, the group of people working on a thing is is what we need first yeah. before we can ask for more maintainers there. I mean, if we were because I, I made like two changes to GitLab Shell, I am yeah. one hundred percent not qualified to be a maintainer on that. Yeah, or, that's how I feel as well. <laughs> and I think if, if, it was, if it was, say, written in Rust, which is something I write in my spare time, then I would feel like, yes, okay, I could probably be a maintainer for that, even without the context, because at least I can look at the code and say, yeah, that does what you say it does. But with the Go code, uh, for me, I'm still learning Go. Uh, that's quite difficult. And I think that's the case for quite a lot of people. So there is that sort of problem where we either have to find Go experienced Go programmers who can just be maintainers because they know Go and then they can fill in the context or we have to have people working on the project that as a dedicated sort of thing for a few months in order to have the experience to know what could be merged and that sort of thing. Yeah, we have as someone who reviews and triages 
community contributions, you know, I'm often assigned the initial review on things in GitLab Shell or Helm charts, and things like that. And it's like, well, I'm 100% not qualified to say that this is good. I can say that it does what you say it does. Um, but in terms of hitting that merge button, absolutely not. There's definitely a difference between the vast majority of maintainers, back end maintainers anyway, who are Ruby proficient and quite GitLab specifically proficient. And then those other projects that we kind of look at and go, well, it's probably all right. Yeah, I think it, the, it's kind of similar in a way to, I don't know the whole GitLab application because I work on one specific part of it, but because I'm very experienced in Ruby, I feel confident that I can look at someone's merge request and say, yeah, okay, you've changed a part of the application I've literally never used, but it does do what you say it does because I can see that it does that. And I can't do that um, for work course and show. And I think uh, quite a few people are finding that as well. So how can we identify other projects like that? I mentioned earlier, there's 288 products, projects. Shell, you've mentioned a few things. There's probably less than five people who are experienced with it. So that's kind of one, one thing. It is a go, that's kind of another factor. How can we identify of those 288, how many fit into this like shell problem? And then maybe we can find ways of, how do we solve the maintainer problem for something like that? It'd be interesting to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sean. Sorry, well, I, think, I think one way would be to just look at what we ship by default. Um, it's a good start. So like, you know, what's in the Omnibus package or the Helm chart by default, like, you know, Shell has to be on, otherwise GitLab doesn't work. Um, workhorse has to be on, otherwise GitLab doesn't work. Um, I think those sort of required components are probably where we see the most pain. Um, another thing that occurred to me when I was talking about Go is that as far as I'm aware, we don't have this issue with Runner, but Runner has a dedicated team. Mm. And like Robert's team, that is a team that basically only works on Runner as opposed to a team that owns Runner that spends a lot of time working on something else. Um, same so same with Gitterly, I guess, as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, if, if the Gitterly, if there's a problem with Gitterly maintainers, I'm assuming the Gitterly team will figure that out. I don't think the working group needs to figure that out because nobody on this team actually works on the Gitterly team. Uh, nobody on this call anyway. So, you know, <laughs> I feel like, you know, we, they, they've, they've got all the tools they already need to fix that. And for those things as well, we specifically hire backend engineers with strong Go experience and not having that would disqualify them as, from, from being hired in the first place. for posting that list. Uh, every every project under GitLab org that's not under a mirror, right, uh, is important. Like we don't need someone to maintain a uh, live event, hopefully. <laughs> I think I'm technically a trainee maintainer for Rouge, the, uh, the code highlighting uh, library. Right, Valerie, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, so uh, everything under GitLab or like you would need to be looking at the alternative keys. So whatever is under GitLab or namespace in the alternative key in that file, uh, that's a GitLab project that we use by default in Omnibus GitLab. So to answer the question of which all are the ones important enough. Let me actually <clears throat> provide a different link to what is in scope and needs to be de-scoped of this working group. So here in my uh da, da, da. there's a link that says internal only and if you click on that there's a huge list which is all gitlab org yeah and so the question becomes go ahead 
I was going to say, should we start from one of these lists and prune them? Because um, I think for the, the long list there, like a lot of them are in security products, um, which again, will have a dedicated team working on them, um, or they are, um, uh, what was the other example I was looking at? Um, model ops will also have a dedicated team working on it. So should we start with that list and prune that by like, someone already owns this, this working group doesn't need to care about it? Could be. I think that's a, a good topic of discussion. I would be curious. Um, <clears throat> I would be curious if they see problems. You know, just a second. I have terrible allergies. Um, Robert's team does own GitLab Shell. It's just that his team isn't working on it. So is that true of these other projects? But I think that is a good place to start. I'd be curious. Um, I'd be curious about Gitalee and Runner. But that is an idea. So, unless there's more to say on this, what I would recommend we do is Sean. First of all, I think that's a great idea to start with if you want to comment on that issue and just kind of recommend that so we don't forget um, and maybe dive into that a little. Um, Robert, is there any other action that we can take based on this conversation? Because it's really more than just what I said about is part of product or not. Um. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell, I guess. Um, it'd be, uh, maybe it'd be good to just narrow the list down first and then we can figure out what we want to do about it after that. Um, I think like Workhorse and Shell are their own interesting problem. Um, it'd, be, uh, but it'd, be, it'd be curious to see what other ones we have. So like, if we have other Ruby projects, I don't really worry about those because in theory, anyone can pick them up unless it's really bizarre. Um, any of our backend engineers can, should be able to be a maintainer for a Ruby project if it needs it. Um, but the Go ones that are technically owned by the Ruby like primary teams are, are a bit of an odd case. Yes. Okay. Well, you're part of the working group now, and so I trust that we will not forget this topic, but I am very curious to see at the end of, at the end of this how we solve for these problems, the workhorse and shell issues. Okay, you're next. Uh, I'll go through the second one quite quickly, but uh, so especially for like the last six months, I've just had a red circle on like most of the time. <laughs> and the problem is that uh, I, uh, partly it's me, I get very easily distracted, but um, reviews are very counter to our general sort of uh, the way we work, in a release so in a release you kind of have the freedom to pick and choose the order in which you want to do things when you want to work on things but when you receive a review you effectively have a two-day time constraint um so you have to do it quite quickly or you're interrupting other people's work so it's almost like getting like a priority issue uh that you have to work on you can send it off to somebody else, but then you're only really sending the problem on to somebody else who also might be having the same issue and so it sort of gets spread around a bit. And so if you get like too many, you put the red circle on, which stops you from receiving any more reviews and you clear them and then you take the red circle off and then you immediately get eight new reviews. It, it seems to always come in a burst. I never get like a steady trickle. And there is now the orange diamond as an option. And that's almost how it feels the default should work, if that makes sense. Because if you have the orange diamond on, I think you get about 50% of the number of reviews. And that feels more like the correct ratio because otherwise it always goes in this like spiky burst. You put the red circle on, you take it off, you go straight back up to like five plus reviews. You put it on, it goes back down and it gets like this all the time. Um, and I've, I've noticed it before. I send a, like an inordinate amount of reviews to Sean for some reason, but in bursts. So like every two months, Sean gets like five to 10 merge requests from me because his name always appears for that month. It's very weird. It's like it's going in a loop around the people and some people just end up with a really large amount of them all at once. So I don't know if there's something a bit odd with that. I don't know if it's just me. Um, yeah. It's, it's not. Um, 
I think, so one of the things I'm, I, I was working on, but seems to have been taken over quite effectively by uh, other folks is getting some more of that useful data in a way we can use. So there's now capacity data in the roulette dashboard. Um, I, from what I can tell, and this is anecdotal, although it seems to chime with what you're saying, um, is that there is a, a small, well, a large group of maintainers that have a red circle on a lot of the time. And that means that the pool of available maintainers is sort of trending downwards over time, but we don't have the data to really back that up yet. So I'm hoping we will soon. Um, but yeah, like you say, because of that, you put the red circle on, you get nothing. There's a small group of maintainers. Eventually you take it off. That small group becomes one larger and then you get a, an abnormal number. Um, so I think the useful thing is going to be seeing how long people leave the red circle on for. And if we've got maintainers who have it on for multiple consecutive months, perhaps suggesting that all maintainers who are not on PTO remove it for a while and see if that kind of alleviates this sort of circle um, that we have of a small group becoming a smaller group. That'd certainly be interesting. I mean, we could always recommend as a first step that, or like ask that people set it to the orange diamond instead and just see if that allows us to ease it back on a bit um, without everyone suddenly <laughs> getting the, the initial yeah. burst again. Um, Although, maybe, because uh, that's what I've done at the moment and it's much less painful right now. There's a definite irony in the sense of if we, if we were to ask all the available Wacom maintainers to remove their red circle, everyone would get free reviews yeah. um, because that pool would immediately quadruple in size. Um, I, I'm not suggesting we do that. I don't think it'd be a particularly popular idea, but it kind of would have an intended effect, I think. Yeah. And I if they moved your point uh, up because it seemed to be related to this. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, the note I've added is exactly what uh, Robert mentioned. So, when, whenever you take off a red circle, you get an immediate, you know, uh, rush of uh, reviews coming to you. So, I think the problem with the current approach is there's no way to control the upper limit of what I can take. It's like if you remove the red circle, okay, give me everything. So, and that is going to get you a feeling of, oh, I am overwhelmed with reviews. So if we can get to a point where I can control the maximum amount of reviews I can do in a day, and if everybody does that, I think we will have enough space for uh, all the reviews. And red circle is like uh, the the red circle will now correlate to uh, uh, putting zero as your status uh, because I, I can't take any more reviews, but you can obviously take one or two at any point of time if you know that it won't go beyond two. So if everybody does that, I think we will have enough space for all maintainers. I think it makes sense to me and uh, especially uh, for one reason with the uh, the current way of doing things is when you get that burst of reviews when you take the red circle off because you have essentially two days in which to do those you effectively have to then say well I'm doing no other work for the next two days and you clear all the reviews um, it, it inevitably because you always get one that's just like 140 changes or something and just makes you want to die inside um and you have to sort of work through all that for a really long time uh but being able to control that like one or two a day for me is a really easy like i can do that in the morning before i well like, while i check my email or something that's a nice sort of if it was regular doing 10 a week that way is much better than doing the 10 in one single day <laughs> that you end up getting and then having to be red circle for the rest of the week to catch up again um so i quite like that idea personally it sounds like we might need guidance. Um, before we run out of time, Ms. Natalia, you've got six, but I think C is very closely related to this. So if you want to take those two before we wrap up. Yep, just a very quick point uh, about review and maintainer ratio. So for example, for front end, we are met our goal in these terms. Like we are, I think, twice as doing as good as a goal. But the problem is. I think this tool is not showing the real ratio. That's why I shared the statistics. So maybe we should change it not to reviewer maintainer, but reviewer to available maintainer ratio. Because I can tell for front end, around 50% of maintainers are constantly busy on red circle or something else. No blame. Like we all have our work to do, but we need a tool to measure a real ratio, not like how many maintainers do we have on paper. And yeah, what do we no, do absolutely. when we meet the goal? Yeah, go ahead, Sean. 
No, I agree because at the moment, like we've targeted our maintainer ratio based on an assumption that wasn't really like based on any data. It was just sort of like this sort of feels like the right level. But then if we have more people on Red Circle, then we don't actually have that many maintainers. Then the ratio is actually not what we think it is. Um, so I definitely agree. And, and since we've started collecting the historical data, uh, you know, the back end maintainers for the main GitLab project have sat around the 50% mark. So that ratio is already 25% wrong. Let's get an issue for this inside of the um, Max, what's yours? De develop metrics to provide yeah. more transparency. Let's get, a, I think there are a few issues here. Um, Natalia, your maintainer available ratio kind of, we see a problem like we don't need more maintainers because we're meeting our ratio, but the ratio is wrong. Um, and maybe based on Minaj and Robert, your two kind of concerns here, maybe guidance, like based on the data that we are gathering as part of Max's initiative, what is the number that we should expect to do each week? And can we cap it at that? And is that the limit? And how do we prevent the bursts? So can you all do that? I'm going to add action items. I'll create an issue on, on uh, my effort. Thank you very much. Um, we've only got three minutes, so let's wrap up. Like I said, I will add action items um, in a bit. After my next call, I'll add action items here, and I'll tag you in it. Um, is there anything that we want to spend the next three minutes on? Okay. I in so appreciate my, this turnout. I was going to say my last two items I can uh, do another time or we can uh, do in uh, an issue because they're not as important, I don't think. Well, everything is important, Robert. I will also say please join the Slack channel if you uh, haven't because um, a lot of these conversations bleed over into Slack and then they end up in an issue. So that works too. Okay, enjoy the rest of your days, everyone. And thank you so much. Oh, bye. bye.